Welcome to the very last chapter of Steps to Christ and the devotional series that we've been going through, uh, myself and you together. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. It's been my privilege to just share my thoughts that I get from reading this beautiful book. Um, and every time I read it, it just uh, it, it speaks so many new things to me. Um, it just is, is such a blessing. And it's good to be able to really solidify my thoughts and share them with you. And I hope you've been blessed by this as well. Uh, again, the last chapter called Rejoicing in the Lord. And uh, we're going to learn some very practical uh, outworking of the Christian life. Uh, we've learned how to follow God, uh, follow Christ step by step. And now he sends us out into the world what does that look like? It's all about rejoicing in the joy that we have in Jesus uh, that we share with others. So uh, before we dive right in, let's start with prayer. And, uh, and then we'll see what uh, Ellen White has to say about this very important topic. Father in heaven, thank you so much for being uh, with us here today. We just invite your presence. We ask for you to speak to, uh, to me. Um, and as I share some thoughts, speak to those who are uh, joining me here on this last uh, of the series on Steps to Christ. And I just pray that um, it will impact us in how we look at the world around us and how we interact with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to jump right in here. The middle of the first chapter, I, I love the, the picture that Ellen White gives uh, of Christ sending his disciples into the world. And you and I, we're disciples, just as much as, as the 12 disciples were back in Christ's first advent. We are as much sent into the world as they were sent as apostles into the world in their time as well. And listen to how she de describes it. She says, in every one of his children, Jesus sends a letter to the world. It's just beautiful. If you are Christ's follower, he sends you a letter, in you, a letter to the family the village, the street where you live. We are sent, uh, in us, God is sending a letter to the people around us that we interact with. Within our sphere of influence, within those people that we are acquainted with, that we have conversations with, that we talk with, we are sent by God to, uh, as a letter to share with them um, the, the, the beauty of God's character, and uh, how he has transformed our lives as well. And uh, she, in just a couple chapters later, she says it's so important because of that, it's so important not to gather up gloom and sadness, to murmur or complain, to give people this false, a false misrepresentation of God because God is not like that. Um, in fact, uh, somewhere here, she says that it's the work of Satan uh, to misrepresent God's character. You know, his goal is to get people to think God is stern, um, judgmental, condemning, uh, all the things that he's not. Because we know him, for those who follow Jesus, who represented who the Father was to us, we see him as loving, caring, protecting, um, patient, uh, kind, good. This is how we're to represent God to the world. And so Christ sends us out as a letter, uh, doing the same thing that he did as a testimony of to God's true character. And so uh, that's the way she starts off here. Now, uh, as you go down a little further, uh, a few paragraphs down, you'll see a paragraph that starts with, thank God for the bright pictures which he has presented to us. Uh, she goes on to say, Let's, let us group together the blessed assurances of his love that we may look upon them continually. So um, in, in opposition to our tendency to be discouraged, maybe even to fall into despair because life isn't going as the way it should, the enemy tempts us to complain, um, we just have a tendency with our nature to look on the bad side of things She's saying the way to combat that is to group together all the blessed assurances of God's love and look upon them continually. 
Don't look on the negative stuff that's around you. Look on God and his blessings continually. That is how we keep our minds focused uh, on um, what God has done for us. It's, I find it so easy sometimes when I hear something negative or see something that is not good to just get discouraged about that immediately. You know, just, oh boy, this world's a terrible place. And although it is in, the, in, in many respects, there are some wonderful things that God is doing in this world. And in, in every respect in my life, when I look at it from beginning to end, he has blessed me. He has brought me to places I never dreamed that I would go. I never thought in the world that I would ever be a pastor, that I would ever teach the word of God. In fact, I was far from God. But God has blessed me and brought me uh, to where I am today. And as I look back at those blessings, that keeps me going to the future. Because I know one day I will, I will see Jesus face to face and all the struggles of this world will be completely gone forever. And I'm looking forward to that day. Um, she says uh, uh, about another paragraph down toward the end, or at the beginning of that uh, paragraph, all this is harming your own soul, speaking of you know doom and gloom stuff. She says, every word of doubt you utter is inviting Satan's temptations. Now that struck me, because I know that there are lots of things that we can do that I need to avoid, especially, that might open the door for Satan's temptations. But you know, this is a good reminder that when I doubt anything that God is doing as he's working in my life. You know, I've kind of gotten to the past where I don't doubt God. You know, I don't doubt God's existence. There is absolutely no question there. I don't doubt God's love, his, his mercy upon me, the grace that he gives. I don't doubt that. But whenever I, I doubt maybe how God is working or he's, you know, how maybe I'm not satisfied with what's happening in a given situation, you know what, if I utter that, I'm inviting Satan's temptations. And I think part of the reason for that is because when I utter doubt, the people around me that hear it also are led to doubt. And so it's very important that we um, don't do that. She goes on in that same chapter, if you talk about your feelings, every doubt you express not only reacts upon yourself, but is it is a seed that will germinate and bear fruit in the life of others. And it may be impossible to counteract the influence of your words. Wow, I, just being careful, not just for myself, because it opens up temptation, but being careful what I say, that I don't express doubt or unbelief to others, because I may not be able to reverse what those words say. That holds me to a higher level of accountability to make sure that I'm keeping before them a clear picture of God and his character and how much he loves and cares for them. You know, as a pastor, um, you know, I have lots of opportunities to counsel people and I always uh, am very careful about that to make sure that I'm encouraging, not trying to discourage anybody, but letting them know that God is w with them and he's patient and he loves them and he will bring them through their challenge. And uh, I find that's the best possible practice that I can you know, maintain in my efforts to, to encourage others. Um, now, in, the, in a couple paragraphs later, she says, all of us have trials, griefs hard to bear, temptations hard to resist. And then she says something interesting. Do not tell your troubles to your fellow mortals, but carry everything to God in prayer. Make it a rule never to utter one word of doubt or discouragement. And I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking, okay, I know in the Bible we're to, it says we're to bear one another's, one another's burdens. Well, how does someone know that you have a burden if you don't share that burden with them? And I don't think that's what she's saying here, actually. I think she's just talking about it in everyday conversations, even our interactions, maybe especially our interactions with people outside of the household of faith. Um, that as we talk with them, to not talk about troubles, but instead talk about God and his power to overcome those troubles. And then, of course, encouraging others to carry those things to God in prayer. So I just, I think it's good, it's a good rule of thumb to not, when we interact with others, to not um, belabor the difficulties of life because they will come up, but to try and steer them toward a positive. That God exists, God loves them, and he has much better plans in store for, for us than we currently see right in front of us. Um, 
Okay, this, this next one kind of st struck me a bit uh, because of a prior experience I had. It starts with, it is often said that Jesus wept, but that he was never known to smile. Uh, <laughs> I chuckle at this because uh, there was a, a lady that came to church. The story was relayed to me, so he, they didn't come to, she didn't come to me, but this person was a guest speaker at our church, and this was relayed to me later, that um, as he was interacting with the people in Sabbath school before he was going to speak that day, uh, that afterward he sensed that this one lady um, wasn't really happy about some of the comments that he had made. And so she approached him and she said, you know, I, I don't know um, what your picture of God is, but Jesus was a man of sorrows and he did not smile or he did not laugh. And, you know, his response was fairly immediate, um, probably a bit reactive. And he said, well, I don't know the Jesus you serve, but the Jesus I serve uh, loves joy and laughter and smiled a lot. Um, but this idea can be, it can, it's out there. Some people think because he's a man of sorrows, he never had opportunities to smile or to have joy and to laugh and those things. Uh, that is not the picture of Jesus in the gospels whatsoever. Yes, he was a man of sorrows because he had many sorrows in that there were those that rejected him. But he didn't go about living life with a frown on his face or with a somber look on his face. He had a pleasant look on his face. He had joy that was expressed from him. I mean, why, why do you think it was so easy for children to want to come up to him and sit on his lap? I mean, I don't know. Uh, of an adult that is somber, that a child just naturally wants to go up to and hang out with. It just doesn't work like that. So um, she goes on here saying that Jesus' countenance did not wear an expression of grief and repining, but ever one of peaceful serenity. His heart was a wellspring of life, and wherever he went, he carried rest and peace, joy and gladness. Uh, that's Jesus, and we need to remember him in that way, especially as we think about him and imagine him with us day by day as we walk with Jesus. Remember, this is steps to Christ. And now I believe that we're talking about steps with Christ as we've come to know him. Um, she says a few paragraphs down, it is not the will of God that his people should be weighed down with care. Uh, God doesn't want us to be weighed down with care. I know we're going to have trials. Um, he's not... He just doesn't remove us from our trials or remove the circumstances around us that cause us a sorrow at times. Um, but what he wants to do is he wants us to remember that he's a refuge for us. And she says that here, he does not propose to take his people out of the world of sin and evil, but he points them to a never, never failing refuge. God is our refuge. We can go to him when we are struggling. We can go to him when we feel sad and he wants to cheer us up he wants to let us know that we are loved that he's there to care for us to keep holding on to keep thinking about the things that he has done for us and how good he has been because that's the way he will continue to be until we see him again very soon uh, let's see in his sermon on the mount it's another paragraph down Christ taught his disciples precious lessons in regard to the necessity of trusting in God. So she points to the very practical um, outworking of our faith, which is to trust in God with everything we go through. And so there are lots of those things in the Sermon on the Mount. We don't have time to do that uh, here as we summarize this chapter, but, um, but a beautiful picture that Jesus provides. But I, I do want to cover this last thought here as we wrap up. Um, as she's talking about us finally um, being welcomed home to where Jesus is preparing a place for us in heaven, in the New Jerusalem. Um, she goes on to say in this paragraph, I think it's the second one from the end, there... Uh, the companions there will be, will not be the vile of the earth or liars or idolaters or the impure and unbelieving, but they will associate with those who have overcome Satan and through divine grace have formed perfect characters. So in other words, this time of life, the time that we're living here, the ones we will associate with for the rest of our eternity 
are those that have formed a character in the likeness of Christ, uh, referring to that as a perfect character. She says, every sinful tendency, every imperfection that afflicts them here has been removed by the blood of Christ and the excellence and brightness of his glory, far exceeding the brightness of the sun, is imparted to them. And the moral beauty, the perfection of his character shines through them in worth far exceeding this outward splendor. All right, I just want to make a couple comments here at the end. Because, you know, uh, there's a lot of baggage sometimes that comes with this idea of having a perfect character, forming a perfect character. Um, of course, Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And um, so we are called to be perfect, uh, to perfectly represent God um, and Christ in, in character, um, in our moral deportment, um, and in our interaction, interactions with others. Uh, so this statement by Ellen White, uh, I think probably trumpeting the idea from Scripture that we should be perfect, like our Father in Heaven is perfect. Uh, you need to dive into other or, or places elsewhere where she talks about having a perfect character to understand what she's describing. So I, I just pulled a few uh, things out here. And one of those quotes that I have just comes directly from Steps to Christ, the same book, in page, on page 57. So if you back up a little bit, you'll read this. Character, because she's talking about perfect characters, right? The character is revealed not by occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. So our character, who we are, is not revealed in one single mistake or one single great thing that we do that looks good, <laughs> righteous. But it's a tendency of the habitual words and acts. It's the way we generally are all the time. Now, uh, you can read elsewhere. This next one that comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 65. She says, at every stage of development, in other words, in our personal walk with God, in our growth with him, in every stage, our life may be perfect. Now, that's, that's very helpful because sometimes I don't feel so perfect. But she says, in every stage of development, our life may be perfect. And we know that part of that development includes some mistakes that we make along the way. Um, the occasional not-so-good deed, uh, something we shouldn't have done, a sin that we have done that we knew that, ah, how did that get the better of us? Uh, somehow the devil got through and tempted us and we failed God. But, you know, at every stage, as we walk with Jesus, our life may be perfect and she goes on to describe that if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. So, you know, don't be discouraged when you don't feel like you have a perfect character, as she's describing here. Because in God's eyes, perfection is the tendency of where your life is going. It's where you're headed. It's how you're letting God and his character shine through you on a regular basis. Don't be known by some, or don't think of yourself as by some single act or mistake that you have made, a sin that you committed. You know, parents don't give up on their children that are little because they make a single mistake. You know, they teach them and they help them grow and they learn from that mistake. And God wants to do that with us as he perfects us in character. Uh, there's another one from Signs of the Times, November 5, 1896. She says, as God is perfect in his sphere of action, so man may be perfect in his human sphere. Um, and to qualify that a little bit in another place, Testimonies, Volume 2, page 549, she says, we cannot equal the pattern, the pattern that Christ gave us, but we shall not be approved of God if we do not copy it. And according to the ability God has given, resemble it. So our, of course, our, our goal in life uh, our effort that we make to walk with Jesus and to abide by him. Certainly there is the power of God that gives us the strength to keep, to obey God and keep his commandments. But there's also uh, an effort on our part that meets him there, that receives God's grace and lets him change us. Um, uh, part of that effort is this idea of um, copying the pattern, seeing Christ in the scriptures and following his ways, following how he he revealed the Father. We can also reveal the Father as he did 
in the way that we live. And uh, like in the life of David, he was a man after God's own heart. I believe that speaks probably volumes uh, in regard to what a perfect character really looks like. A heart for God that recognizes when he's, he or she has made a mistake, confesses, receives forgiveness, but keeps walking with God, is able to, even in the midst of occasional misdeeds and things that aren't good, uh, form a character that is perfect every step of the way. So anyway, I just I love that picture of, of, of perfection, biblical perfection, and how uh, Ellen White uses it, and I hope you do too. Uh, lastly, I just want to uh, again say thank you so much for joining me during this entire series. I've enjoyed doing it. I hope you've enjoyed it too. I hope God is working in your life in powerful ways. And that this book, as it has affected me, has impacted your life and has caused you to um, just feel all that more confident in God who began a good work in you, who is faithful to complete that work before Jesus comes. Because I know he will as you take steps to Christ and as you walk with him every single day. God bless you, and we'll hope to see you on down the road. Have a great day in Christ.